Hi, this is Pill Eater. I'd like to discuss games as fine art. A couple of months ago, I was at the Game Masters exhibition at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was a museum full of video games as fine art. All the video games were playable from 1970 to present day. The present day games were full of nepticistic SJWs and Irene bro whites with no real relevance. I didn't know half the games that were there, and I'm pretty sure they're just art students using mommy and daddy's trust fund to publish these games. There were tons of little kids and white male Asian female couples, as well as some Asian male white females as well. They displayed the video games on screens like an art piece with a controller. And so it was kind of this interesting art display of some sort, gathering this brand new Eurasian culture. Note, these are video games, not just games. The irony is that this fine art can only be on a screen, like some kind of digital art. It's very likeness to YTMNDs, which uh, I have have origin of producing my first You're the Man Now Dog in 2008, which is a, a screen art, by the way, if you can just Google search it. Also, such arcade games like Pac-Man exist in many. There is no one and only Pac-Man game, like in the fine art world, where there's a one and only art piece. There were many Pac-Mans published, and they were just displaying an average Pac-Man arcade cabinet and calling it fine art. So postmodernism is a heavy Achilles heel for this art world justification. Like Andy Warhol, when Warhol publishes his Campbell Soup and goes around about par par pop art, it really has to make you think about what is considered fine art. I think games are being confused with interactivity. All future art wants to be like James Terrell. James Terrell makes these lighting museums, kind of like um, Rothko, where you walk into a piece and it's just one color, and people experience or feel the aesthetic. Chris Crawford writes about this in his book about interactivity and as well his game design books, between the definitions of games and interactivity. Art is becoming more interactive, and more interested in a virtual reality. People confuse games with virtual reality. I mean, is life a game in itself? Now why should fine art be forced to adopt games into the work? This is just a big misconception about terms, and how people are thinking about things. I really liked The Neverhood. And The Neverhood was a clay-animated point-and-click game that acted more as a museum piece than anything. You controlled a character and you went throughout this very bizarre clay-animated world. Now, is it really a game or an interactive piece? You know, I like the art, but the art is not the game itself. You do, you do move around mazes and solve puzzles and make choices, but the substance of the game is very minimal and not really a part of it. I just liked it because it was by Doug Tenaple of Earthworm Jim. There was also Silhouette Mirage and WarioWare Inc. I grew up with these games and enjoyed its spontaneous outcomes, challenges, and art characters and stories. Now the story is not the game, and this is very confusing because some people say that they play it only for the story and the game is just the medium of storytelling. Many modern games try to back up a bad design with a good story. Um, I'm thinking of Fallout 74 that recently came out. Again, game design is often confused with game development. The creation of the game is not the creation of the superstructure or how the game have played itself. I would further footnote this in a book by Keith Bergen called Game Design Theory, as he points out what the problem is with all this capitalism and consumer culture and selling toys with interactivity to people. And he really makes some interesting notes on that. Now, the video games are fine art warlords. Elect Undertale as fine art. Undertale, rather, is a worship of youth culture of Asian Aryanism and art house uniqueness. It's actually rather a mix of WarioWare and Silhouette Mirage, and it's a cliche, it's, it's been done before. It's democratic worship. All young millennials want to play a game like Undertale, maybe because it's the art or the cartoons or the humor or the mechanics, but it becomes 
this clusterfuck of things and a reflection of our current Asian Aryan society. Other games, like Metal Gear Solid, is popular solely for the sophisticated story. Yes, the in-game mechanics of sneaking and taking out the controller is innovative as well, but too much of it relies on story than skill. There's no replay value once a story is told. These games, like all video games, follow Jesper Jewell's series of progressive challenges, like in Earthworm Jim 2. In Earthworm Jim 2, it's just a series of levels and challenges, like you're running hurdles at the Olympics. There's no, there's no attached story or similar mechanics, it's just challenge after challenge. And this is kind of the theme you see both in Undertale and Metal Gear Solid. It's just a big challenge obstacle course. Now, Raphael Coster is an Achilles heel to the progressive games will be like Shakespeare cult. Everyone cites a theory of fun as fact, when it just reuses old motifs and pop psychology from irrelevant fields of study. Coster ultimately wants a genderless and classless virtual world, as said in his YouTube video on his history of virtual worlds. Now, is that moral? Why would anyone want that? To me, that doesn't sound like ludology, and it sounds like there's he has an agenda, a justification so he can get high off his own supply, like a drug dealer doing his own cocaine. Also, the Italian linguistic, uh, linguist Marco Arnudo argues narrative over ludology. He has a chapter titled, How We Stopped Worrying About Replay Value and Learned to Love the Story. Again, Stories only last once, cited by Louis Pulsifer, so how can we just love the story and call it quits? Arnudo himself has a YouTube channel himself where he collects stuff after stuff. He's a hoarder. When he dies, where does it all go? He is mentally suffering and a byproduct of selfish capitalism. So how can we trust this guy about narrative trends from the late 1960s to today when it's really just, again, he's just going along with Raphael Coster is saying, nobody is really doing something new. They're just falling along like sheep. So what are video games then? As cited earlier, Jesper Jewell, in his book Half Real, Video Games Between Real Worlds and Virtual Worlds, he argues that video games are both real worlds, real rules from the traditional game model, and as well, virtual reality from the fictional worlds. The theme is so empowering. And that's why we think it's mostly a good medium to tell stories from, or some new virtual reality fine art. Now on this diagram in the book, uh, I believe uh, Bernard Suits cited this, or as well Jules, I'm not so sure. We could see that not games are hypertext fiction, ring around rosies, freeform play, like what dogs do when they chase their tail traffic. And then we have the borderline cases, which is chance-based gambling and skill-based gambling, like killer bunnies or something. And then pen or paper role-playing games, where there's flexible rules and you can turn it into storytelling. And again, storytelling is not games. You can see it right out the diagram. There's also this thing of zero-influence games of Conway's Game of Life, which I will get to in a bit. But we could see games in the center are fixed rules, negotiated consequences, variable outcomes, player effort, player attachment to outcome. You know, there's a lot to be considered which are games, borderline cases, and not games. And video games seem to be the best of both games and the fictitious world of not games. But let's go to two Wikipedia definitions. I've tried actually sort of searching for games as fine arts, fine art, but I get these two articles. List of video games considered artistic. Uh, it says that although several countries offer legal protections to all video games that are similar or identical to protections offered to other artistic works, and all by the standard all video games are considered as art, the article lists games that are specifically identified by art critics and video game brewers as works of art. Interesting. But then there's just art game, which is another definition on its own. Art game or art house game is a work of interactive news, media, digital software, art, as well as a member of the art game subgenre 
of the serious video game. The term art game was first academically in 2002, only a few, only a decade ago, really, almost uh, 15, 17 years ago. Describing a video game to design emphasis of art of whose structures tend to produce some kind of reaction in its audience, just like if you were to go to an art museum. I'd like to go over some artistic games first. Games which are not art games, but, um, you know, people like to consider them art. And these are some of my favorites as well. Uh, Quix is a game where you have this little buzzer and you make squares and you try to get the squares and color them in. And then you have Tempest, where you go down this hole and dodge demons. And then you have the new game, Res, which is kind of a tribute to Quix and Tempest. It was kind of this new, you know, revival irony kind of game. But th what makes Quix and Tempest interest is this 1970s worship of the old tech, you know? The same why people like Vaporwave for remembering the 80s so much. It's this technology that looks artsy when you play it. But it is itself is a game, and there can be Quix and Tempest World Championships. And Res is more of a um, music game. We also have um, Rodney Allen Greenback for artistic games. Rodney Allen Greenblatt designed or made the art for Parappa the Rapper. And Parappa the Rapper originally was a music game, the first of its kind. And people do like Greenblatt's cartoons in it. And this was displayed at the Game Master's exhibition. But it has art over the game. As you can see, Greenblatt did the album cover for They Might Be Giants' debut album. So, does it make it fine art because the art is more popular than the de game design mechanic itself? So these are just some examples of artistic games, but not games made as fine art. Now we get to the crux of what art games are. And two good examples, I would say, is uh, first Moondust, which was for the Commodore, and it basically was this kind of interesting fish tank game where these spaceships and colors would make noises and kind of like a drug experience, ways to get high, you know. It's, it's not like you're smoking weed or doing coke to get high and seeing a state of ecstasy, but you're watching it on the board, and I think Moondust gives a certain level of high. I'm, by the way, citing 250-something ways to get high without drugs by Ethan Rosenberg, I believe his name is. But anyway, I find this as a reoccurring trend in art games. We also have Bubsy 3D, or Bubsy Visits the James Terrell Retrospective, which is a joke game, and got the domain name Bubsy3D.com, and it's an, a satirical, but also post-postmodern, making fun of art and consumer culture and yes it is a game where you collect things but it becomes more of an art piece where there is no objective you just get up the controller and start controlling around and feeling the aesthetic so if games were to ever be fine art they'd be something like moon dust or bubsy 3d and james terrell retrospective but there is criticism against art games and I think this is a high criticism as well, which I don't think games work as fine art. So I'll read this. This is a screen cap from Wikipedia, and it says, Criticism of the term art game. Alongside the growing use of the term art game, numerous members of the video game culture have reacted negatively to its application. Critics have noted that the term turns away a certain segment of the gamer population who reject the notion that games can be works of art, and who equate art games with elitist gaming. This kind of reaction has in turn caused some game developers to reject the use of the term to describe their games, instead using terms like not game, ungame or simply refusing to accept any categorical labels for their work. Some common criticisms include of and criticism of the terms include a view from some within the gaming community that describing a game as an art game means that it's pretentious and not fun. Kind of like the game Train, everyone's playing this card game and the winner is actually sending Jews to a concentration cramp, camp and meant to shame people who are into far-right or neo-Nazi ideology or a view that those who play and enjoy art games, known as art gamers, are snobby and not to be emulated. 
That's absolutely true, and I was just saying this at the first part of the slide with the trust fund kids and their amazing so-called video games or fine art that usually falls under that category. A view that the term art game needlessly introduces a distinction between high art and low art within video games where it has never existed previously. So again, if Bubsy 3D, the first one, not Bubsy 3D James Terrell, is somehow superior to the original Bubsy game, then why should you care? You know, a view that the term art game is overbroad and that is incoherently used synopsisly with indie game, thereby improperly co-opting the concept of innovation when the innovation itself is not art. And this is exactly some of the art events I'm getting to. Right? The ideal that the term um, art game are in is exclusively claimed to artistry with the medium of the video game and that art games are therefore superior to other forms. Again, I will get to that in a bit. Very great point. The ideal that works today labeled as art games lack the formal properties that can be properly be called games or art. Right. And this is another influx of what is considered games of whether it's Raphael Coster getting his virtual reality escapism onto everyone. Now, here's a digression here. I, I've said previously the zero influence games. Um, there's an article by Jesper Jewell and Stefan Jork about zero influence games. And that's basically like watching uh, rain raindrops fall on a window and say which one's going to get to the finish line. You kind of make up a game, but players do not influence these said games. If zero influence games are true, then can't we just read a book and make up a game and apply it? So this is a very interesting thing about how people put games and meanings into art games as well. And we have to distinguish zero influence games from Chris Crawford's definition of interactivity. Well, what happened to the fine art board game paradox? I like more board games myself, right? So, for example, Tom Wham, one of my favorite game designers, on his website he sells one-of-a-kind, unique, prototype art board games. There is only one copy of Phil Philothene Finance, and he's selling it for $220. There may be five more editions, it's number and sign, but it's an art piece. Only one can exist. Unlike Pac-Man, there were like a hundred million, almost, I don't know if there was a million Pac-Mans, but there was a lot of Pac-Mans. You can play Pac-Man anywhere. How can you separate one particular Pac-Man as fine art compared to the Philothene Finance as the one and only? Or look at the bottom one where we have the Royal Game of Ur. This is an artifact. It's old and historical and should be kept in a museum. I don't know how many copies of the Royal of Ur was made, probably a very few. But this itself, there's only one and only game. So if the masses say that fine art can be games, well, then everyone has to play it. And that dismisses the quality of people experiencing art, right? You can make prints of Andy Warhol or Thomas Kincaid, and you can look at all the art. But again, you it's, it's not possible if there's one and only art. There's one and only Van Gogh and Starry Night. You can't have uh, multiples, right? So there has to be one authentic core copy of it in order to sell and make it in art auctions. And I think board games do this better, really, depending. And that makes you think about who owns and what copies and about the postmodern ideals about game and ownership or art and ownership. Now, here is a great criticism against video games being fine art. This is by Roger Ebert, and I copied this from his Wikipedia page, but as well he wrote this in 2002, Video Games Can Never Be Art. He says, To my knowledge, no one in or out of the field has ever been able to cite a game worthy of a comparison with the great dramatists, poets, filmmakers, novelists, and composers, that a game can aspire to artistic importance as visual experience, I accept. But for most gamers, video games represent a loss of those precious hours we have available to make ourselves more cultured, civilized, and empathetic. And Ebert hits it right on the nail that consumption destroys appreciation. By watching an anime visual novel hangtai, you can't have the same experience by reading Proust or Shakespeare. You know, there's something more about our people and interest in those arts than just some thing that's representing now that's making you in the dark. There's also another quote by Ebert. One obvious difference between art and games is that you can win a game. 
It has rules, points, objectives, and an outcome. Santiago might cite a immersive game with points and rules, but I would say that it creates ceases to be a game and becomes a representation of a story, a novel, a play, a dance, a film. Those are things you cannot win. You can only experience them. And another perfect quote. Now, I read the comments in this 2010 article Ebert wrote, and the top commenter says, Oh, it's a shame Ebert couldn't experience games as fine art. What, Undertale as fine art? Again, I think a lot of people, or millennials, just don't understand Ebert's spot-on um, criticism about video games and games itself being fine art. So it's best to acknowledge Jesper Jewell's half-real argument. That is, video games are both are both game and fictional worlds. Uh, that, but the masses and elites acknowledge virtual reality over the game itself. Right? It's not. It's not that we enjoy it for playing, being Bobby Fischer and playing Jess. It's more like we like virtual reality and storives, which are have already been in our technology. Now, a game is a mental thing. Patty cake, twenty questions, I spy, cows and bulls are all played in the mind, without components. Video games are similar that the only interface is the controller and the screen. Therefore, we apply the mental mind image of a game onto something we know is art. And that's why we get confused as games as being the new art form. Games, you, If games were to be art, we have to say this physically is a game system. So how can we appreciate fine art if we're forced to play a game with it that will give us the feeling of either winning or losing? This will change our perception of the fine art. That if the artist who puts a game to his art wants us to win or lose or play this game, it's going to change. If we lose, we're just going to tell everyone, oh, I lost. If you read The Warlock of Firetop Mountain by Steve Jackson and you flip to a page and you fall in a pit and die, that's the book. That's the art. Someone, someone might have got longer. But games can destroy the perspective of art, and it doesn't really make it Shakespeare. Fine art is for intellects that observe, write, and experience. Games can turn off an intellect, intellectual form from the game. An intellect from the game, yeah. So, I want to go this also well with history as well. There was this long weep, leap. Right here we have a picture of an Egyptian playing Senate on a board, right? So as Ebert wrote, you know, fine art was experienced and created through the printing press, music, theater, film, film and television, right? Film, television. They all create passive, zero-influence forms of art where we observe, right? As stated by Jules, whether this is a zero-influence game or not, I don't know. Video games present both the game and television film. Those who say it's fine art, Forget the game aspect or just ignore it together. Do you need to play a game to enjoy Infinite Jest? Will a game make it better? Where was games influenced in the Western canon for over a thousand years? If they were fine art, we would put games in a museum a long time ago. But, get, but again, games are used as artifacts, not as fine art. The game can be an art of fine art as an artifact, but games are mental and do not exist physically in front of us. Like the Egyptian playing Senate and having rules, this is the engine that controls it. So again, when this art, we worship Egyptian art, but not the Egyptian playing the game as art. So where is that, that dichotomy or that, that divide? See what I'm saying? So people who advocate games as fine arts accelerate their decadence. They completely disregard all Western art previously before them, even all non-games. So if it's a non-game, I guess it's not important. Why should the new fine artist be forced to become a game designer? Video games exist in many copies, as I just said previously with Pac-Man and board games, as well as, you know, Magic the Gathering looks close to being fine art. But that's because it's rooted in trading cards and people collected trading cards for fine art. The game itself is not art, but the pieces of the game are. Like getting Black Lotus for $10,000, right? It may do something cheap in the game, but it does not make the game fine art. It's just an art piece that makes it, right? Those who keep saying someday in the year 3000, for, you know, fine arts as video games, are rooting for nihilism. 
if not a charlatan excuse to justify their explosive profession of getting high off of video games, you know. I, I think I meant to write exploitive profession. Sorry about that. You know. So, the end game of video games as fine art is Undertale. We all desire what other people want, as a French philosopher René Girard wrote. We learn and get jealous our, over our hobbies from others, you know, Instagram, Facebook, high school friends and mentality. If the introverted is doing it, the extrovert has to do it as well. Undertale is fine art to them, as will be just like Steven Universe is. It's like with the whole CalArts movement that is happening. We like Undertale because everyone else likes it. Therefore, it must be good. So how can video games be fine art if the art is expensive and uh, no, if the art is experienced and appreciated through merchandising, storytelling and playing with toys? This is consumption. This breeds an unintellectual attitude of life, as written by Henry Jenkins in 2003. Lowbrow decadence cannot breed new age intellectualism. As Jewel wrote on page 20 in his book, it is hard to create a game about emotions because emotions are hard to implement in the rules. Again, the game is mental. How can patty cake be fine art? We don't. We can't display it on a museum. It's not there. The charlatans are talking about virtual reality, not game design or lidology. They criticize me and others as a radical lidologist, as if that's the only thing. Now, theme and art is good. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not everything. That's not games. A game may improve one experience of fine art, but this does not constitute that all future fine artists should be forced or become game designers to enter the fine art world. Why should my uh, museum of used condoms imply a game to it if I'm putting it in an art museum? Games have challenges, like winning and losing and test one's skill. Why should skill be enforced to enjoy a fine piece of art that demands it, but may in turn ruin the experience for the observer? Again, the fighting fantasy motif. If I lose, that's it. That's not fine. I, I don't know why I should enjoy that. Jules' paradox about rules state, The enjoyment of a game depends on easy-to-use rules presenting challenges that cannot be easily done. So how can the stupid enjoy sophisticated complex challenges tied to art for intellects? If you're making the rules as easy as possible, as Richard Garfield did in his game Keyforge, then how can people enjoy sophisticated forms of art if you're constantly dumbing it down for this stupid egalitarian bullshit? The game separates itself from the art piece. So how can the game, as an engine and mechanic, be ever appreciated? Is it like Cosmic Encounter, where there's random various outcomes? Is it a modular and experimental synthesizer that making a bunch of noise? I do believe, I can't recall the Lodologist's name, but he said that our enjoyment of games come from something like Cosmic Encounter, where it's just a bunch of random mechanics happening at once. Now to end here, if video games were fine art, we would watch other people play them. This is kind of a cuckolded philosophy. We would watch Jacksepticeye and Markiplier play games and actually us playing games, and this has proved popular as they have millions of subscribers. Now, we could appreciate artistic art games more by watching other people play it than make observations like in an, like making observations in an art museum. Like, w w the, what happens is instead of us playing the game, we revert back to this going to the museum and watching that person play the game and then experience the art by watching that person play it. It's very cuckolded philosophy. So why should we imagine a future art museum, of, you know, James Terrell stuff with screens hanging with controllers. This is ver that's this is virtual you know that is virtual reality not fine art you know I I can't imagine someone makes some grim dark piece of art and then there's a dangling controller or some touch screen to view it. Some people want that, but that's just some weird interactivity they're talking about, and they think that makes it better. Again, the old James Terrell. The average person does not want to put in the effort to play at a difficult game, even if it's fine art. You know, back to Jules Paradox about the rules and how easy it is to do harder things. It's just a bizarre, it's just like making a, a, a STEM student. 
you know, trying to make them a stupid person into STEM. So we revert to our anti-game nature and enjoy and appreciate art, what we have been doing as humans for over a thousand years. So again, I just think it's just not possible to appreciate um, video games as fine art or games as fine art for that matter. I mean, it just takes a certain intellectual class to appreciate and you just can't dumb it down for people. And again, the people who keep saying it's a fine art, Undertale is our end game. Thanks for listening. www.pilleater.com